My name is Marty Shepherd, and it's a pleasure to be here as a District 9820 Australian Rotary Health Chair by introducing an Australian Rotary Health Indigenous Scholarship recipient, Sarah Large. Sarah was a recipient of the Indigenous Health Scholarship during her final year's undergraduate degree in 2016 and 17. She's now working as a neuros neuroscience physiotherapist at the Royal Melbourne Hospital working with patients with a range of neurological conditions, such as stroke, brain injury, multiple sclerosis, and Parkinson's disease. Sarah has a passion for helping people and providing holistic patient-centered care. She's currently completing a master's in public health and plans to specialize in Aboriginal health and wellbeing, graduating in 2023. As a member of the Australian Physiotherapy Association's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Committee, she is an advocate for First Nations health and wellbeing, undertaking many roles and projects, both internal and external to her clinical role. Lift the Lid on Mental Illness is Australian Rotary's Health National Annual Fundraising for Mental Health Research. This campaign, founded by Australian Rotary Health Vice Chairman, Greg Ross started in 2016 in partnership with the Rotary Clubs of Victoria. It has now been extended to all Rotary Clubs across Australia. Every year, approximately one in five Australians will experience a mental illness. And in order to help future generations of young Australians, we need to look ahead through research and find out how we can prevent this type of illness occurring. I would now like to warmly welcome Sarah Large with her own presentation on researchers behind the Australian Rotary Health. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you for the intro, Marty, and thank you to everyone for having me um, today. I'm just first going to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm presenting to you from today, which is, um, so I live in Caulfield North. Um, so this is the land of the Bunurong people of the Eastern Kulin Nations. And I'd like to extend that respect um, to any of their elders, past, present and emerging and any other First Nations people present today. Um, so I thought today we would just cover a little bit about my story and uh, my family as well as my experience with the Australian Rotary Health Indigenous Scholarship. Um, my current role at Royal Melbourne Hospital and um, endeavours for the future. So I'm a proud Burupai Waramai woman. My mob come from the mid-north coast of New South Wales, um, as you can see on that map there. So my, uh, I identify with both sides of my family, my mum's side being my Aboriginal side and my dad's side being from um, uh, having English and Irish heritage. So just popped in a few pictures here. So my, this is my great grandmother down in the bottom left hand um, part of the screen. So that's my little, uh, little Nana Clark. She was um, a part of the stolen generation, as was grandmother, who is seen in the picture on the right hand side. So that's my, my mum's mum in the purple and my dad's mum um, on the other side there. In terms of the Australian Rotary Health Scholarship, I was a recipient of the scholarship from 2015 to 2017, so in my final few years of university. Um, I studied at the University of Sydney, so it was a bachelor's degree, so an undergraduate degree in applied science physiotherapy. And I was sponsored by Whole Road Rotary Club in New South Wales, and it was a co-sponsorship, so they were 50%, and then the other 50% was sponsored by uh, Dr. King Gann. So that's my profile as seen on uh, Rotary Health Australia. And a part of the application process was writing up what you can see there on the right hand side. So how will I contribute to improving Indigenous health as a qualified medical practitioner or healthcare worker? It's really, it was actually really interesting reading this over this past week and a really nice kind of reflection on how far I've come, given that I wrote this in 2015, so we're seven years on. Really cool to see the, the progress over the last seven years. In terms of the application and 
the processes around the scholarship. So it's that application process, writing up how you plan to contribute to First Nations health as a health professional, as well as a phone interview with Cheryl, who then goes through. I'm sure it's a very rigorous process and I don't really envy her in terms of having to go through all of the applications and I'm sure they get so many amazing people apply for this scholarship every year. And then she will connect you with your sponsors. And then in terms of the ongoing, I think that the unique thing about the Australian Rotary Health Scholarship is that you get to engage with your sponsors pretty much as much as you would like to. And they do keep you accountable and linked in, which I think is really nice. And it works differently to a lot of other scholarships where you are just the recipient of money and then there's no kind of personal connection there. So during your time as a recipient, you have to provide ongoing proof of enrolment. So at the start of each semester, as well as your transcripts from the previous semester and a written report about each semester. So usually that's around a page talking about subjects and placements and things that you've really enjoyed over the last semester and as well as as I was saying opportunities to link in with your sponsors so I went and presented at Holroyd Rotary Health one of their meetings as well as lots of emailing back and forth with Dr King Gan and a few of the members at at Holroyd Club as well and obviously it's been an ongoing relationship now I'm in my fifth year of working fifth year out of uni and opportunities and that relationship with Australian Rotary Health is still ongoing as I'm here today. So I guess the scholarship really helped me just to reduce that stress of part-time work. You know, my parents are just a typical middle-class Aussie battlers and they have their own mobile coffee business and they often work. It's not uncommon for them to work six or seven days a week. That work ethic really runs in our family and I have been, you know, working since as soon as you're legally allowed to, what, 14, nine months. Going into university, I think there was a really big shift in how much commitment is actually required to really um, delve into your studies. So having that scholarship just helped kind of ease the pressure of that. Focus, obviously, to be able to focus more on my studies and particularly around placement time. It was really, 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 really beneficial to have that scholarship. Studying physiotherapy, we have to complete a thousand hours of clinical work during our degree Um, and the placements can be all over studying at Sydney University. It was all over New South Wales. And I know that a lot of other universities around Australia, it's the same. They can send you anywhere. Um, So for one of my placements, I was actually based at Foster Private Hospital in a rehabilitation ward where I had to endure the costs of my transport and accommodation even while while I had to live up there. And even some of the placements based in the city, I was still living at home during university. So it would take me at least an hour each way, which really took away the opportunity to work and earn money. Overall, it um, having this scholarship helped me graduate on time in 2017 with first class honours. My honours paper was actually published the following year, so in 2018, in the Journal of Physiotherapy, which was really exciting. And yeah, I think that that was just a really great opportunity. And I think that sums up how much scholarships really do help students. Since graduating, I worked at the Ronald Shaw Hospital in Sydney. So it's a major trauma hospital. Um, and that's some of the new graduates I worked with in that photo there. So they have a new graduate program that ran for 12 months. And then I was offered an ongoing junior rotating physiotherapist role. So I stayed there until April 2020, when I moved to Melbourne, just in time for COVID and took a job at St. Vincent's Hospital, where I continued working around different acute wards. So all over general surgery, medical wards, stroke and neurology, neurosciences. Neurosciences was what I wanted to do. And if you're going to be a neurophysio, Royal Melbourne is the place to do it as the Victorian Centre for Uh, neurosurgery and a major major stroke service for our state it's the place to be so I'm really happy that that's where I've ended up and taking on those kind of casual weekend shifts really helped me get a foot in the door at the Royal Melbourne Hospital so I officially joined the neurosciences team there in August last year and that's where I've continued to stay so uh, within that role I rotate across every six months we rotate between two wards so we have a 30-bed stroke and neurology ward and a 30-bed 
neurosurgical ward, as well as providing some kind of clinical expertise with patients that might still be in intensive care units or other wards like cardiology. So the scope of neurosciences is really, really broad. We see people with, as you can see here, spinal surgeries, brain tumors, stroke, traumatic brain injuries, and a range of other neurological conditions like multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, Guillain-Barre. It's kind of endless and every single patient is so different and their journey is so different and I really love that challenge and I find the work so so rewarding so I think this is where we can link into mental health quite well often when we think about people for example with stroke we would think about their physical and cognitive impairment but sometimes forget about all those other things that can come with having neurological or brain damage so one in three stroke survivors actually experience depression in their first year after stroke and often this can continue continue for years to come and can never leave. This can occur because of a range of different things, including just the, the direct insult to the brain. Um, so obviously our brain is our control centre for our emotions and behaviours. We have lots of important tiny parts in our brain that help us recognise when it's daytime versus nighttime or how to appropriately interact with other people, socialise all that emotional intelligence. So it can be a result of exactly where the stroke or the tumour or the bleed on the brain is, as well as a range of other factors. So fatigue is really big. Obviously, our brain is so important. And if it's injured, it needs time to rest. And obviously, that then has an impact on people's fatigue levels. Another important consideration is just being in the hospital environment. It's been shown that People who spend a long period of time in hospital suffer with mental health illnesses, and usually that is related to being away from family and loved ones, um, as well as the mental challenge of rehabilitation. It's not only physical effort of learning to sit again, stand again, walk again, get your arm moving again. All of that can take a really big toll on people and can be a massive hurdle to overcome. So if we kind of talk about these four main elements, depression, 33% of patients, most of these stats are related to stroke, given that it affects so many people. I think I was reading that the number is around 55,000 Australians a year will suffer a stroke. So yeah, in terms of depression, 33% show symptoms of depression in the acute phase. So within that first four to six weeks and 40% of those patients go on to be symptomatic for at least one year post their stroke. Anxiety, 25 to 50% of patients show anxiety during that acute phase of stroke. Fatigue occurs in somewhere between 40 to 74% of patients post stroke. And obviously this is an ongoing issue as well. And finally, sleep disturbance, which kind of links into all of those things. Often it can be a cycle that we need to consider. 50 to 70% of patients experience sleep disturbance after a stroke and somewhere between 10 and 50 experience disturbance of their sleep white sleep wake cycle. So that's your brain learning that it's nighttime, it's time to go to sleep, it's time to wind down versus daytime staying awake and staying active. I guess my role within this is just recognizing that this is a really big challenge for the patient in themselves I and mean, they need to consider the relationship of these things that they can exist independently of each other but they're also going to impact each other and impact their physical recovery and function. So my role within this would be educating the patients so linking them in with appropriate resources like the Stroke Foundation website. They have a lot of resources on depression and anxiety after a stroke as well as linking stroke survivors in with other people who are experiencing the same thing so more like a support group and if necessary making referrals to other appropriate team members. So for example our psychology and mental health doctors and at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, we are fortunate enough that we have things like art therapy and music therapy that can really, really help those patients. Sometimes these patients stay on the ward for six weeks, eight weeks. I've got a patient at the moment who's been there for over 100 days. So this can really, really impact people's mental health. I know during COVID, just staying at home and I was still fortunate enough to be able to go to work every day and come home. I think that social isolation, which a lot of patients experiencing hospital, that in itself is a really big thing. So I can't imagine being in the same room for, you know, these periods of time that patients do. 
And finally, trying to make therapy meaningful. So that might be setting goals with the patient that they, things that they really want to do, things that are meaningful for them. So for me, sometimes I think, oh, well, obviously they want to learn to walk again. So let's just focus on that. But for them, the most important thing might be just getting from their bed into a wheelchair to be able to get them outside with their family. So sometimes it's dialing things back a little bit to make sure that what we're doing with them is meaningful to them and significant in their recovery and their journey. Other things like setting up enriching environments. So taking into consideration that fatigue level, they may not be able to come into the gym and tolerate an hour of therapy, but they might be able to do lots of little bits of therapy throughout the day. So setting up their room and their environment to be able to incidentally participate in exercise and therapy, as well as, I guess, other things like advocating for patients to move into rooms that have windows and things like that, that can make a really big difference to someone's mood, being able to see outside and see the sun, and also that kind of sleep disturbance issues in terms of recognising night and day. I think as physios, we are really well placed to establish relationships with patients. Often, you know, nurses change every shift every day. And even though they look after patients for a chunk of the day, they may not necessarily see them through their journey day to day to day. Same as doctors, often they are just, they're amazing at what they do, but they're so busy that they, they're lucky if they get to spend five minutes chatting with the patient every day. Whereas from an allied health and a physio perspective, I get to spend time, decent time with every patient, getting to know them, getting to know their family. And I feel like that really helps me zoom out sometimes and really advocate for them um, in terms of all of these little things like moving rooms or organising them to have a wheelchair to get outside over the weekend. All of those things really, while they're small to me, probably make a really big difference in a patient's journey. This is just a photo of our, one of our initiatives that we um, had during Stroke Week, which was just during August, acting fast. In terms of external to work um, and my clinical role, I'm a member of a few different committees. Obviously, stroke and neurosciences is one passion area of mine, but Aboriginal health and wellbeing is another. Through the Australian Physio Association, I'm a member on the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Committee. So this committee, I'll be on this committee for a three-year tenure, almost 12 months in now, and we are aiming to increase cultural safe practice within clinical settings for both staff, so physiotherapists working in these environments, but also patients in this environment too. And working in a culturally safe practice can obviously have a really big impact on someone's mental health and how much they feel like they are accepted and they belong and feel safe within that space. I also sit on the Melbourne Health's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Governance Committee. So this works quite similar to the committee with the APA. So that's been a really great experience, getting to see the differences between a, the APA, which is nationwide, versus Melbourne Health, and being able to draw on some of those similarities and differences. At the Royal Melbourne, we actually have a Aboriginal health unit, which has a few Aboriginal health liaison officers who act as that kind of in-between person between clinical staff and the patient. They will um, make sure the patient understands their condition, what's required of them, follow them through with their appointments and just make sure that they keep linked in with the health services so that they get the best outcomes. A lot of my role within that committee has been to be one of the, provide that kind of clinical feedback. As often with committees, you get a whole range of people and particularly with this committee, there's a lot of non-clinical staff who don't quite have the same perspective of what actually happens on the wards and on the ground. I see my role as providing that clinical experience back so that we can hopefully achieve some more tangible outcomes for our patients. And then finally, the Australian Physio Association has a few special interest groups and a member of their neurology. So I briefly touched on this before, but within these committees, I see my role as representing allied health and clinical staff, but also advocating for both staff and patient. Both committees that I'm on, it's a mixed group, clinical, non-clinical, but also 
people that identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and people that don't. So I see my role really relevant across all aspects. And finally, like other initiatives that I'm currently doing, I'm, as Marty said earlier, completing my master's in public health and I plan to specialise in Aboriginal health and wellbeing. I will be due to complete that this time next year. That's just been a part-time study trying to complete it outside of full-time work, which has proved a challenge. Teaching at the University of Melbourne, so that's an opportunity that, that has come up a few months ago. They've been redeveloping their program around cultural sensitivity with First Nations people. Um, And rather than, I know that when I went through university, we maybe had around two lectures that focused on working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And um, now it's something that is kind of embedded throughout their programs and they may do specific modules and things related to that. So I've been involved as a tutor and also facilitating some of their visits to the Bunjalaka Centre at Melbourne Museum. If you haven't been along to that exhibition, I highly recommend it. And finally, the Australian Physio Association accreditation process of titled physiotherapists. As you get more experience as a physio, you can not only specialise but then become titled. It's quite a rigorous process to become a recognised title physiotherapist, quite common in private practice physios with like musculoskeletal titled physios. Throughout this process, they have revamped it to have that cultural sensitivity element to it as well. So this work has only just started for me in terms of reviewing applications and making judgment on whether I feel that that applicant is acting in a culturally respectful and culturally sensitive manner. And finally, 2023 and beyond, I will be completing a research project that is a part of my master's in public health. The project that I'm planning to do, I'm still in the planning stages at the moment, is exploring secondary stroke prevention in First Nations Australians. So what we know is that when you have one stroke, you're more at risk of having another. And this is even higher in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So I want to look at why that is, and I'm sure that a lot of that will have to do with not engaging with services properly, not feeling culturally safe to engage in those services, or perhaps not understanding the importance of engaging in those services. Through this process, I will likely be interviewing a range of people, so patients who have discharged from hospital, but also clinicians so that I can get different perspectives. I'm also leading a project at Royal Melbourne to establish some First Nations cadetships. How I'm hoping it will work will be that we get um, some students across Allied Health in their final or second final year of university coming to work as an Allied Health assistant um, on the wards, gaining that extra clinical experience during their university breaks and things. And then the hope is that they will then be able to continue on as a new graduate physiotherapist or occupational therapist, speech pathologist, whatever their discipline is, kind of supporting them throughout their final years of study and then into providing them with a job at the end of it all. I think through all of this, I really hope to build relationships with not only the universities, but also schools, because I feel that my profession in particular, we have very limited identified Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in allied health. I think the national goal is 3% and within Victoria, we have less than 1%. And I think that it's, while it's great to partner with universities and support their students, I think we need to start a bit sooner in terms of schools and really get students involved in their studies and provoke that interest in working in health. Thanks, Sarah. That was very informative and and very interesting for many of us that have a very limited knowledge on physiotherapy. I'm now going to pass over to Mark and he's going to lead the questions. Thank you, uh, Marty, and and thank you, uh, Sarah. What a great insight. I mean, uh, the insight that you gave us in the process for gaining a scholarship. That, mm-hmm. That's something that I haven't heard in the past, and that's absolutely fascinating. Uh, and I'm also amazed at the, the breadth of work uh, mm-hmm. that you have to actually cover in your role as, uh, as a physiotherapist. So I'm sure uh, that there's there'll be a few questions uh, out there from people um, that we, we'd like to ask you and, and get your insights uh, on that. So I just just ask people to pop them in the chat uh, or uh, raise your hand, uh, your electronic hand preferably, uh, and then uh, we'll, I'll get to them uh, as, as we go through. 
the first question that we have is from uh, District Governor Paul, um, and it's actually uh, a great question. I think it's it's again one that we don't really uh, think about much because uh, Australian Rotary Health has quite a few scholarships out there, uh, and the question is in your. Uh, role of what what you're doing in the hospital and also uh, being um, a scholarship uh, recipient from Australian Rotary Health, do you actually get involved with other Australian Rotary Health uh, scholarship awardees? During my time um, as a recipient, as a student, we did lots of um, we had lots of catch-ups, so usually there was a Christmas catch-up at the year to really connect with other students. Um, and then in terms of ongoing relationships, uh, I have definitely stayed in contact with a few people, most of whom were studied at my university but may have been different levels, who we connected through Rotary Health um, Australian Rotary Health. So, for example, um, I am still friends with um, Cameron, who was a recipient the same year as me, and we were friends throughout university, but then also with uh, a couple of other people that were maybe a year below me or two years above me, that um, having that opportunity to connect at those Rotary events really helped form those friendships. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, I actually don't think we have an ARH scholarship uh, alumni, and I, you, you've just got the uh, the brain uh, ticking there as to something that maybe uh, we need to um, uh, to get into train. Um, we have another question here from um, uh, one of our assistant governor uh, governors, Peter Sindri, um, and he asks. Do you have a view on the growth or otherwise of public awareness of mental health issues uh, since you've been involved with your career? Yeah, I think I think COVID really highlighted mental health for a lot of people um, and the importance of looking after our mental health and other people's mental health. So I think that there's been a, a fair few positive changes that have come from, from the global pandemic in that regards. Um, and I think for me, it's something that as I started as a physiotherapist, I was very much like, what are people's physical impairments and how do I just target that? They're very kind of silo rather than thinking more broadly and understanding the impact of mental health and people's social environments and and all of those other things that really make us who we are and will impact people's ability to participate in therapy and really get the best outcome. You did touch through your presentation on how we can encourage Indigenous people to participate in the wonderful world of health careers. But can I just ask... What really, from either a school or uni point of view, would you like, what do you think would encourage more Indigenous students into the health field? It's a really big question, a really complex question, because we know our history of uh, trauma in Australia. Um, a lot of First Nations people don't feel safe entering hospitals or um because of previous experiences or families' experiences. Um, so I think that the first thing to do is to establish those culturally safe workplaces so that when we have students come in for observation or actual student clinical placements, they, they recognise and they feel like this is a place that I want to work, this is a place that I feel safe. I think that's so important. It's, you know, we go to work every day. You've got to feel like you belong. Um, and I think that that's what a lot of people struggle with and what, maybe why they turn away from health um, because of obviously the ties with government and, um, yeah, really that kind of history of trauma. 
Um, in terms of what we're doing, obviously through the cadetships, I hope to establish having the students come in and gain um, clinical experience, but also have not only clinical supervisors, but cultural supervisors. Um, so people throughout the hospital who are in identified positions um, can have that kind of cultural lens as well. So at Royal Melbourne, we actually have an elder in residence, Ani Marlene Birchill. So she can um, be that cultural support for a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff. Kind of back, I guess, is schools and sparking that interest while people are at school. Um, and we have started to do some workshops going out to schools, um, telling them what, what we do as, you know, there's there was medical staff, nursing staff, allied health staff. Um, yeah, a bit about what we do really and what it is actually like working in a hospital and providing that care for people. Um, but I think the first step is making safe workplaces so that people want to come and then people stay as well. I think that's actually uh, a good uh, lead into the next question uh, from Judy McKee, which you've touched on a little bit of it there. Uh, but Judy's interested to know whether there are measures are being taken in other health services to promote involvement with our First Nations people. As in other health services other than Royal Melbourne, would you... Yes, yeah, I, I yeah. think it's yeah. not just Royal Melbourne um, and not yeah. just physio, it's sort of the, the breadth of health services and providers. Obviously, most of my knowledge is around what's happening at my workplace, but some of the some of the initiatives that we do are based off other health organisations. So I know that Monash um, and Eastern Health also have First Nations cadetships for allied health staff, as well as uh, St. Vincent's actually as, as well. And a lot of health networks now are seeing the impact that Aboriginal health liaison officers can have with patients too. Um, right. And linking Judy them in McKee's with... Home. Linking them in with um, kind of that... Different looking... Other community uh, engagements, Marty. so for example... VARs, like Victorian Aboriginal Health Service, and um, so that people, we can act in a preventative health manner as well, not just coming and fixing the problem at hospital, but preventing further problems once they get home in the community. We, we all sort of know there's a little bit going on in, in our First Nations people space. And uh, I think, you know, the more that we talk about it, uh, the greater the awareness is going to be. And uh, I think we're just uh, scratching the tip of the iceberg mm -hmm. uh, today. Uh, and I just hope that, you know, uh, over the coming years, uh, we can really increase uh, our awareness. Um, has anyone else got any other uh, questions I'd like to ask? Yes, uh, past District Governor Don Ripper. Sarah, I, I sit on the board of Australian Rotary Health and listening to you and a couple of your uh, colleagues, both contemporary and, and since, um, it really makes it, worth, makes it worthwhile. We put an enormous amount of effort in, into it and just so good to see um, what, we're, what the... When, You'd probably have got there without us, but um, what you're doing, um, what you're able to represent is just extraordinary. And uh, it, it's uh, probably the reason why, why I'll stay on for my second three years. But, uh, and look, thank you very much for, for that today. Um, I will give you some contacts of um, some people down in Gippsland, um, uh, Indigenous Health service leaders uh, who may be of interest to you and may be of, uh, may be of value. Um, they've uh, made a, a terrific input into uh, the mainstream, but as, as Indigenous practice, practitioners. But, um, I, I know how to contact you, so... <laughs> 
That sounds Thanks. great. Thank you, John. And thank, thank you. Thank you for your kind words. Yeah. Thanks for having me, everyone. It's been great. All right. Thank you. Um, now, we'd just like to throw to uh, District Governor uh, Paul, who's going to share with us uh, a few Australian Rotary uh, health uh, facts. Thank you, past District Governor Mark. And uh, yeah, it's interesting to hear uh, past District Governor Don uh, speak about the board and so on. Thank you, Sarah. Good afternoon, everyone. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to provide a few facts and background. Many of you will know Australian Rotary Health is one of the largest independent funders of mental health research in Australia. Our district, District 9820, founded Australian Rotary Health. A Rotary Club of Mornington member, Ian Scott, upon hearing a, the distressing stories of cot death, became a person of action. Ian went to his Rotary Club and asked that they raise $2 million. $2 million, just like that. This ambitious request expanded to clubs in our district. Then it expanded further to all districts in Australia and on to the annual meeting of the Rotary Zone Institute. This started our first national homegrown project and our longest serving homegrown project nationally. Now we know it as Australian Rotary Health. From the first research done by Professor Terry Dwyer, statistics showed that it was the sleeping position of babies that was an issue. We are now strongly encouraged not to place babies face down to sleep. This has resulted in an 80% reduction in cot deaths or SIDS worldwide. All because Ian Scott, a Rotary Club of Mornington member, was a person of action. Australian Rotary Health was the stepping stone for cot death research, obviously, and this research continues today in other forms, funded by Australian Rotary Health grants. Now, Australian Rotary Health provides funding towards research grants, fellowships, and PhD scholarships focused on finding preventative and curative solutions for mental health in young Australians. As of 2022, the funding focus will narrow to the mental health of children aged zero to 12. Australian Rotary Health also provides funding into a broad range of general health areas, provides scholarships for rural, medical and nursing students, as well as ind Indigenous health students. Australian Rotary Health provides funding into areas of health that do not readily attract funding and promotes findings to the wider community. I'm now going to give you a few uh, four or five examples of some research topics today. Interesting subjects. Incorporating natural therapeutics into brain can cancer treatment. Enhancing social media literacy to decrease body dissatisfaction. Well, that sounds complex. Worse mental health outcomes found in asylum seekers. Another one, are we neglecting the mental health of intensive care survivors? And this one's close to Marty's heart, equipping teachers to respond to mental health problems in the classroom. Australian Rotary Health has been funding medical research since 1981 through the generous support of Rotarians, Rotary Clubs, Rotary Districts, individuals, commercial and government supporters. Australian Rotary Health has funded over 50 million in research since 1981. The, the figure at present is 50 million 473,000. Wow. Another fabulous Rotary achievement we should all be proud of. Okay, thanks, everyone. Back to you, Mark. I'd just like to follow that up uh, with um, donations. October, uh, lift the lid, 
um, Hat Day, whatever you want, want to call it, Australian Rotary Health needs your support. So for all of October, I urge each and every one of us to go to their clubs and just mention a little bit about what you've heard today. You, you've heard the process that uh, Sarah has to go through to get the scholarship. And then you've heard because of that scholarship, what she has been able to achieve for her career and also how her work touches and changes other people's lives. So I encourage you all to go to the Australian Rotary Health website. On the website, you can't miss it there, there is the big donate button. Just click on the donate button and it will take you to the donations page. And there it is there. It's a simple thing to fill in. We encourage you to uh, you know, mention the name of your Rotary Club so that Australian Rotary Health can keep a track of where the donations are coming from. You'll see the default amount is set at $50, but look, there is, I'd like to set my own donation amount there. I'm sure that all of our clubs um, know Australian Rotary Health and support Rotary Health. October is the big month. So I encourage you all to mention this at your club meetings and see how we can really give Australian Rotary Health uh, a boost in their donations so that they can only improve and increase the amount of great work uh, that they do across the globe. So on that, Marty, uh, over to you to, uh, to close up. Thanks, Mark. Again, I'd like to warmly thank Sarah. She's especially busy. She works full time. She's on so many committees, she's teaching and she's studying. She's been very informative and very, very generous with the time that she's taken to put into her presentation. So Sarah, thank you very, very much on behalf of District 9820 and Australian Rotary Health. I'd also like to thank past District Governor Mark Humphreys and Barry Thomas, who have been absolutely instrumental in putting together the presentation today. I couldn't possibly do it without them. And to District Governor Paul Mee, who's given his time to participate today.